Hello. I'm going to start and I'm going to start now. He he got the time wrong. Buenas tardes con todos los presentes. Son bienvenidos al día de hoy a la charla que será dictada por el expositor Samuel Vivé. Vamos a esperar unos momentos mientras se van viendo el resto de participantes, por favor.
Muy buenas tardes con todos. Les saluda Carlos Arbizu. En esta ocasión les presentamos la charla técnica titulada Identificación de Zebra Chip Disease en La Papa. Este es un trabajo de investigación que ha venido realizando el investigador San Vigue en referencia a su tesis de investigación. Eh, Sam actualmente está ubicado en, la, en el estado de California, en Estados Unidos, donde él ha venido trabajando durante los últimos meses en el mejoramiento genético de hortalizas y de igual manera en investigación para el procesamiento de los alimentos. Él ha estado previamente involucrado en el programa de mejoramiento genético de papa de la Universidad de Texas A&M en los Estados Unidos con el fin de desarrollar nuevos cultivares de papa para los mercados locales y también para los mercados internacionales. Sam es un profesional que tiene como objetivo combinar sus conocimientos ¿no? en favor de la ciencia y también en favor de la industria para así generar nuevas variedades y de igual manera contribuir en el sector de la academia y también en el sector privado. Le damos la cordial bienvenida a Sam, que nos va a brindar la charla hoy en día. Sam, thanks again for your time, for giving this talk to all of us. I hope you have a nice time together with us and uh, feel free to, to ask questions as well. There are many people interested here to talk more about potatoes. You know, potatoes is a cash crop here in Peru. And uh, we are very happy to have you today on board. So please go ahead, Sam. Okay, thank you, Carlos. I'm happy to have this opportunity. Uh, I will get right in and uh, start talking about uh, my presentation today. Uh, let me um, okay. Let me uh, share my screen. Is it is it visible, Carlos? The first slide. Yes, it's fine. It's fine, Sam. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. So uh, my talk today is going to be about some uh, research a research project that I uh, conducted as part of my work at Texas A and M University um, before when I finished my research there and uh, after that I moved to California. And my research was on a disease called zebra chip. And my talk today, I'm going to have several parts to it. The first part, I will go over the characteristics and a summary of what this disease actually is. And uh, I, I will introduce the uh, potato breeding program research in that part of my, my work in potato breeding. And, and then I will go into the specific research that I conducted to identify tolerance in, in potato. So to start off, uh, the zebra tip disease is an unusual in a sense, it's caused by a, a bacteria, but this bacteria can only infect the plant when a certain insect called a potato psyllid is, is feeding on the plant to spread this disease. It's very similar to another disease that is called citrus green disease that is a very serious disease in almost all citrus growing regions around the world. Uh, but that disease is a different strain of the bacteria and a different strain of the insect. It, it was, so this bacteria uh, disease caused in potato is relatively new 
but, or at least it wasn't able to be identified by scientists until very recently. Uh, the reason this is the case is because uh, the, this, this bacteria cannot be cultured outside the potato plant. The only way to detect it in the plant was by using uh, PCR, which is a, a DNA analysis tool to determine that this DNA from this bacteria was inside the potato plant, but it was not part of the potato DNA. Uh, further studies with the further studies were conducted after 2008 by taking psyllids from infested plants and putting them on non-infested plants and observing that the disease was transmitted. Other methods were attempted to transmit the disease and none of them were successful. And so it was concluded that only, only by these psyllid insects can the disease be transmitted. Although the psyllids can transmit the disease to other related plants, such as we, uh, weeds that are uh, in the same family as potato and then transmit back into the potato in a previous year or in another area. This potato psyllid is uh, native to Mexico and Central America, the Western US, and uh, now it's been uh, found in New Zealand and Australia, even though that wasn't originally where this insect was present. Uh, unfortunately, now in the last few years, there, there has been reports of it being found in Ecuador, but I, I haven't found any information on it being in Peru. And this insect feeds on both crops and, and weedy related solanaceous species. That includes potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, and then a lot of related weeds. And uh, it can transmit the Liberobacteria um, back and forth between these crops and weeds. Getting it, so now getting into this uh, disease itself and what the symptoms are of, of zebra chip disease. It um, has certain characteristics on both the top of the plant and the root. On the, uh, on the top of the plant, we see it, uh, first, the first symptom is very slight purplish yellow coloring on the leaf. And then as time goes on, um, as we see in this picture, the, the plant becomes more and more discolored. The leaves begin to curl and cup. Sometimes there's aerial tuber looking structures along the, the inner, uh, along the nodes and the, the plant becomes stunted. And then eventually as this plant here, this, this is at the end of its life and, and uh, will be, is dead, almost dead. Um, when the plant is dug up and the potatoes are cut, uh, on the raw potatoes here on the left picture, you can see this kind of a ring. Um, and then within that ring, a darkened, uh, a slightly darkened, it can be like this or even more severe. Uh, on the right is after potato chips are made and fried, the, the darkening is caused by sugars and, and phenolic compounds that have been increased. And then when frying occurs, a very dark, a very dark uh, blotchy browning in the tuber appears. So this disease I, is called, considered an emerging disease. Um, going back into the reports, 
uh, sympt uh, some symptom was reported in 1952 in the U.S., but then uh, it, it, there, there hadn't been anything reported until in the early 1990s in Mexico, which is where this disease was first identified. Uh, later, it was observed in the U.S., in Texas, and in Guatemala, but it didn't become a major issue in the United States until 2004. And then after that time, uh, researchers began investigating to find out what this was. At that point, they did not know what was the cause of, of these symptoms. And uh, then it was observed that this disease was spreading into other locations. And uh, the large growing region of potatoes in the US is in the Pacific Northwest. And so by 2011, it was seen over the be, beginning to be found in small areas in the Pacific Northwest, which was really concerning to the United States potato industry. And so after that time, much more research began to try to find solutions to this problem. And uh, it hadn't been seen anywhere in South America until 2019 when it was, it was confirmed to be in Ecuador. So the complicated part of this disease is that only one infected psyllid, if it feeds on the plant, can transmit uh, the a very high level of this bacteria that can cause very severe symptoms. And then very high yield reduction. Uh, because such complete control of this insect is necessary to prevent this disease that is contribute that means that trying to use insecticides to control is very costly and and then even further compounding the problem uh psyllid resistance to the commonly used insecticides Okay. Vamos a hacer un resumen de la primera parte de la exposición de Sam. Y bueno, eh, esta enfermedad es causada por la bacteria Candidatus Iberibacter solanasarum. Esta se transmite por cílidos, ¿no? que son unos insectos emíteros. Puede ser detectado por PCR usando primers. Asimismo, Los síntomas se observan en la parte aérea de la planta y en los tubérculos. Eh, bueno, esta enfermedad de la papa rayada se reportó en Estados Unidos aproximadamente en el año 1952 y se confirmó en Ecuador eh, por el año 2019. Eh, una alternativa eh, es el uso de cultivares de papas resistentes. Okay, Sam, go ahead, please. So my research uh, began on zebra chip in the Texas A&M breeding program. In a, to summarize the breeding program at Texas A&M, the, the purpose is to improve potato varieties adapted to the unique climate of Texas. Um, and that involves working on market classes that the market is looking for, the processing market as well as the fresh market, which would be sold directly to uh, the consumer. And our potato breeding program works in, in a cycle here, I, I just, listed kind of how, how we do our, our breeding. First uh, selection of the parents and, and, and crosses which we made in the greenhouse. 
And uh, after planting out the potato seeds and then producing um, miniature tubers, uh, those are planted in the field and uh, from their selection and the process is repeated. Um, now for uh, do, uh, now for selecting for zebra chip tolerance, our, my focus on the research was in the chipping market class because in, in the United States, the zebra chip disease greatest a level of, of economic damage is on potatoes that are used to make potato chips. Uh, because even a small level of zebra chip disease can cause the whole farmer's field to be rejected by the processing company. Uh, potato chip companies require very specific standards for the potato that they will be using. And uh, they, they require a certain type of potato that is in a certain market class of its own uh, and uh, requires the, these specific traits that I have listed here. And because the zebra chip disease causes the darkening of the chip, e even a small level in the field is very serious. Yeah. En esta segunda parte de la exposición, el ponente nos explicó eh, pues, que el programa de mejoramiento genético de la PAPA de la Universidad de Texas A&M desarrolla variedades para el estado de Texas. Además que se enfoca en papas para el procesamiento y mercado fresco. El énfasis está en el alto rendimiento de calidad resistencia a plagas y enfermedades y también a la resistencia a estreses abióticos. Se comentó además respecto a la metodología que se emplea en el programa de mejoramiento genético del PAPA y que el mercado de chips está en crecimiento, sin embargo tiene la problemática pues, de las plagas y enfermedades, ¿no? como es el de la papa manchada y el papa rayado. The research objectives. Uh, I have, I had were to identify zebra chip resistant or tolerant material in the field and greenhouse, using field and greenhouse trials, and then evaluate the traits of uh, the material that I was screening for zebra chip tolerance uh, for these certain traits that are important to the uh, potato chip industry and the farmers growing for that industry. And uh, also to compare field and greenhouse uh, trials to find out advantages to screening testing so that I could find the best way to identify zebra chip tolerance in efficient and practical way. I started off by painting uh, potato clones uh, from different sources of material that would have wild species in the pedigrees. Uh, it was thought, my th thinking was that wild potato, uh, wild potatoes may have some uh, tolerance that could be used or may have already been incorporated into uh, breeding programs and, and we could look through some material and maybe find some tolerance. Uh, potatoes are both, have both tetraploid and diploid form. Uh, although most, although most wild species uh, are in the diploid form.
my process for my my first experiment using a field cage tunnel. So I planted I planted a diverse set of potato clones, and I used a mesh tent over hoops to keep out any naturally occurring psyllids that may be spreading the disease. And then I used uh, psyllids that had been raised in an entomology laboratory at the university and had been inoculated with the bacteria by being these psyllids were put onto plants which uh, had already been infected. And so I used these psyllids to transmit the bacteria, the LSO, onto uh, a set of potato plants within these enclosed cages in, in the field. And then after a week, I removed the insects from the plant. And then I also had a control cage separated from the infested cage so that I could compare both the infested and non-infested of the same potato clone for each that I was testing. Uh, here's a, pic a picture from farther back and you can see all of my field cages. Uh, some of those are the control uh, with no insects and some are the ones where I put the psyllids on each plant. Here is uh, inside the cage, here where I, can, I uh, transported the psyllids to the field uh, in these tubes. Uh, I, I used three psyllids per plant, so three psyllids in this tube, uh, attaching this bag to a leaf, tying it here, and then opening the tube that allows the psyllids to come and feed on this leaf. Uh, and transmit the bacteria to the potato. Uh, and then I, I repeated the same experiment in the greenhouse it, in, in a more controlled environment to see uh, which might be a better way to get uh, consistent results. And uh, I had slightly fewer number of plants due to uh, number of potato clones due to space, but I repeated the, the same process, putting the psyllids, the three psyllids per plant on, the, on each potato plant that I had growing in the pot, and then also having another greenhouse with uh, control, control plants that had no insects on them. Eh, bien, en esta parte de la exposición eh, nos eh, dieron a conocer los objetivos de la investigación que fueron identificar el material resistente, tolerante en ensayos de campo e invernadero. Además, se evaluaron los caracteres genéticos y se comparan los métodos de evaluación. Asimismo, se emplearon papas tetraploides y diploides, las cuales vienen de la Universidad de Texas y Michigan. Se realizaron también ensayos en campo, usaron cobertores y se infestaron a 70 clones de papa. En los ensayos de invernadero se utilizaron eh, 52 clones. Sam, go ahead, please.
Yeah, so in the in the greenhouse and field, I evaluated the same traits this on the potatoes that were both infested and non-infested with the bacteria that causes zebra chip disease. I looked for the level of survival of the insects and uh, of the psyllids and to see if eggs had been laid, which in laying of eggs indicated that the, the plant had been uh, fed by the insect. Otherwise, it, the insect would have not laid any eggs. And uh, comparing tubers and weight of tubers and yield. And uh, the, the zebra chip score, which I'll show in a minute, and the chip quality, and uh, how many chips would be considered good if they were in a potato chip processing facility. And then uh, finally, in my second field study, I looked at the uh, the quantity of bacteria uh, genome copies in the plant, which I'll get to a little bit later. So the basic test of zebra chip disease is frying them and making potato chips yourself. And uh, so my uh, my method here is sh uh, shown here in these pictures, slicing the potato chip here to get uniform slicing, uh, and then, then frying them in this uh, small commercial frying unit. And uh, according to the same, using the same standards that the industry uses in their large machinery. Uh, and then after after making the potato chips, using this scoring process to manually give each each uh, chip for each um, batch of chips from each potato plant a individual score. Um, the the worst score on zebra chip being a five very dark and um, almost no symptom is uh, a, a very light symptom of zebra chip would be a one. Uh, the same thing on chip quality, your perfect quality potato chip here is shown as a one and the very worst chip quality is a five. Uh, this is uh, browning in, a, in the chip which uh, is not, which may or may not be from zebra chip. It can be caused by a variety of other conditions. So uh, to, to declare something is considered tolerant, um, I set up these criteria. So the zebra chip score rating on a plate of potato chips would need to be would need to average less than two and a half. Um, and to have high chip quality, we would need an average chip quality of less than three because anything at three or higher would be discarded uh, by the industry and would not be marketable. So the the result the the results in in the greenhouse from uh, my best my best uh, tetraploid potato clones were shown here. It it uh, turned out that the greenhouse gave much more consistent result. Uh, because in the greenhouse, we could control the temperature and humidity, and that made the insects more likely to feed on the plant. 
and infect the plant. Whereas in the field, we had some insects dying and a less consistent infection rate. Uh, so, you, so we found a variety of level of zebra chip symptom on the tuber. Uh, some were very, very low. Uh, even with the standard error, they would, these would be considered acceptable. These would be considered acceptable uh, in the processing industry, whereas all of these would be uh, very much, well, all of these, up here had very high level of symptom. Uh, on the dip, on, and we separated these into tetraploid and diploid. Um, we wanted to uh, make a note that on these two diploid here, we had we had no zebra chip symptom at all, uh, which I will. I will, I will talk about it in, in a little bit later. Uh, so comparing the non-infested and, and infested side by side, in susceptible, you can see uh, with this level of zebra chip the disease compared to the non-infested, these are definitely non-marketable. Uh, this one didn't really show any symptoms. It, it may have been one that uh, for some reason wasn't infected. Um, but for our, here is an example of one of our tolerant uh, potato clones where there were still very light symptoms uh, on a few, but uh, the level of symptom was low enough that this would definitely be a very ideal potato variety to be growing in instead of growing this one. On the diploid clones, which were all um, potato clones with wild species uh, as part of the breeding parents. Uh, some are very susceptible as this one and um, other ones uh, as similar to the previous slide showed very minor symptoms. Uh, diploid potatoes have not been selected for frying. And so we found on a lot of our diploids that even though uh, they were not, even on the non-infested, the, the level of browning was caused by physiological characteristics of the tuber, not from any disease, but that would make these uh, potatoes not suitable for the potato chip market, even though they did not have the disease and made it very difficult to determine whether they were infected with zebra chip or not. Okay, para esta parte, eh, eh, bueno, diferentes caracteres, tales como el número de tubérculos, el rendimiento, peso de tubérculos, entre otros. Para determinar la calidad del chip y los síntomas de la enfermedad, se enfriaron las papas. Asimismo, se, evaluaron, se evaluó mediante un zebra chip score y un chip quality rating, ambos de, que estaban en un intervalo del 1 al 5. La variedad de papa tolerante a la enfermedad y buena calidad, el chip tiene un score de mayor a 2.5. Se identificaron además los clones de papa diploides y tetraploides con mayor potencial para tolerar o resistir la enfermedad. Entonces, 
So this is a, a summary of the tolerant clones that we identified in our screening in the greenhouse. And uh, this is just an uh, interesting note for potato researchers. Uh, this one here, a solanem chacoense. Uh, this particular one uh, is a uh, wild origin. Uh, and it's thought that that may have contributed to the zebra chip tolerance. So in, in future research, it would be worth exploring uh, that possibility in more detail. Uh, also, uh, clones from Texas that were selected um, during years with very high amounts of psyllids in the field uh, were also tolerant, which may indicate that selection in areas with very high amounts of psyllid could help to identify uh, uh, tolerance if the population of the insect is very, very high. And then um, another chipping variety was uh, tolerant that we tested from Michigan State University. Uh, in, the dip, in the tolerant diploids, uh, we found tolerance in um, recurrent selection clones that were from five different potato species that uh, Michigan State had been uh, developing in their breeding program. Um, here is a, a picture showing the, the best one in uh, the research. We didn't see any symptoms at all on uh, this diploid clone in any of the testing that we did. And uh, so we could uh, say that it's uh, tentatively resistant, uh, meaning that uh, it, it, uh, no symptom of zebra chip were, were found versus tolerance, um, meaning that symptom of zebra chip still occurs um, but it is much, much less or, or somewhat less than uh, the, the standard commercial varieties. This is another um, wild species that we tested that was from the United States germplasm bank that had been collected at some point from the wild. And uh, it also sh uh, showed no symptom and had very good chip quality. And then here is one that had that appeared to be resistant, but had poor chip quality in the tubers. Uh, they turned brown for reasons unrelated to zebra chip, but uh, some other characteristic of this type of potato. Uh, a, a final test was run in a final trial to look at the level of um, copies of bacteria genome present in, in the tubers. And um, uh, to see if the level of bacteria in the tuber contributed uh, to the symptom expression. Uh, but the, the re, it, it was hope, we hope that this could be used as a way to uh, make a faster screening method. But we found that some uh, tolerant clones still had high levels of bacteria, even though the symptoms were very low. Uh, so it was, uh, so we couldn't conclude that this would work to uh, test for uh, tolerance just from going off of the level of the bacteria that was present inside the plant. Bien, para esa parte, el ponente nos comenta 
que se identificaron a las papas tetraploides tolerantes, de igual manera a las papas diploides. Estas fueron desarrolladas por métodos de selección recurrente por la Universidad Estatal de Michigan. La especie de Secomesorni es tolerante y tiene buena calidad para el chip. Por otro lado, ese Bertauti es resistente, pero tiene mala calidad para el chip. Además, algunos clones tolerantes tienen alto valor RQ, como es el caso del clon DD85302, quien tuvo valor de RQ muy bajo. Continue, please. So I compared the results of uh, the selection testing in the greenhouse and the field. And uh, insect survival was much, uh, much uh, lower in, in the field. And that resulted in lower incidence of zebra chip on my experiment. Uh, also, Internal browning was caused by the environment in the field that we could control that in the greenhouse, uh, which made it made greenhouse the greenhouse research much easier to be more confident in our uh, tolerance results comparing to the field. Uh, summarizing what we found was. Uh, From our screening result, uh, six tolerance uh, in the tetraploids. Uh, these are uh, these have potential to be grown in the commercial setting for potato chips. And then six tolerant tolerant diploids. These are semi wild to wild. Uh, they cannot be used in the commercial field, but uh, future breeding can be uh, done to incorporate um, parts, parts of, of these diploids into the tetraploid. And uh, it can be a, a breeding source for future tolerance or future resistance in commercial varieties. Um, so uh, one of the diploids was tentatively resistant, um, but no resistance was found, even possible resistance in any of the tetraploid clones, which, which makes uh, the research on breeding with wild and semi-wild material even more important in the future if we want to find, uh, if we want to develop a very high level of resistance, it's important that we have uh, these wild species screened and categorized and that we know uh, the potential from the wild material. Um, There's many more potato species that are currently untested. These could contain uh, resistance or tolerance and is given the severity of this disease is very important if we could uh, do much more testing and, and uh, have information on more potato species. And uh, greenhouse screening, showed to be much more reliable since we could control the environment and uh, have much better survival of the insect that we were using uh, to infest with zebra chip disease. Bueno, esta última parte nos comenta que se identificaron a seis papas tetraploides potencialmente comerciales y seis papas diploides, ¿no? semis silvestres, silvestres, y estas tolerantes con alta calidad de chip. Además, eh, se identificaron sesiones silvestres de diferentes especies que exhibieron alta 
tolerancia. Mismo, eh, se comenta que aún hay especies de papa por evaluar y que la evaluación en invernadero es más confiable. Okay, and uh, Carlos, now uh, do we have some questions? Simon, thanks for your talk again. And yes, we have some uh, questions. I will uh, perhaps try to translate them. Uh, here it says, well, the first question is in English. I, it says, uh, uh, well, did you try to use uh, perhaps uh, some genetic modifications in potatoes to generate resistance to the bacterium? No, we did not. We felt that um, if we could find a wild species with resistance, um, that would probably be um, easier than, than um, or it would be the first step. So we didn't do any modification. Okay, uh, perhaps do do you know if the if the potato breeding at Texas A&M's have uh, uh, has some plans for that? Um, no, that there there is um, another department at A&M that does modification on potato, um, but they're just in the experimental areas, and it has not been done in for breeding yet. Uh, as far as I know, maybe this year it, it will be started, but uh, so far all breeding has not used any modification. Ok, uh, Sam nos dice que él no ha empleado algún tipo de manipulación genética, una transformación, es él no ha empleado, eso no fue parte de su investigación, sin embargo, él nos comenta de que en la Universidad de Texas A&M sí hay otros grupos de investigadores que están apuntando a eso, ¿no? Probablemente este año ya hayan arrancado en esos trabajos de eh, justamente modificación genética para eh, brindar resistencia a esta bacteria. Okay. Uh, Sam, we have another uh, quick question. Uh, what, uh, what kind of soil type and whether does the does potato require for cheap processing for, I mean, in order to obtain a good production? Uh, yes, so uh, the, the best soil type is uh, High, uh, sandy or uh, light, lighter soils with um, low clay, low clay content. Uh, all of the chip potato production in uh, Texas is mostly in, is in soils with high sand content. Um, there's some flexibility. It's, it, uh, there, there are, other uh, silt loams, other types of soils that are also uh, very good for production. So there, there's a range of soils that can be used. Okay, but I mean, do, do you prefer, I mean, uh, do you think that sandy soils are preferred? Is that why, what you mentioned? Um, Sandy soils or silt loam soils or uh, high, high organic matter, well-drained soils, all of those are preferred. They all are, are good in certain cases. There's not really one that's better than the other. Okay, that sounds good. Eh, Sam nos menciona de que los suelos eh, arenosos son buenos para la producción de papa enfocada a la a la producción de chip, ¿no? Para la industria del chip, de igual manera los pelos, pues, eh, franco, franco, franco artilloso también podrían ser buenos, no habría problema alguno. En Texas nos comenta de que estos eh, trabajan bien. Ok, de repente alguien quiere abrir su micro también y conversar con Sam, por favor, siéntanse libres. Eh, Sam, we have another question here. Uh, is there a molecular marker to identify, to identify zebra chip resistance? No, there is not. That, that was why, one reason why uh, this research 
was was um, needed because there was no other quick way to identify any resistant or tolerant potato. Pesam nos indican que no hay todavía marcadores moleculares desarrollados para identificar pues a esta enfermedad en las en los clones de papa, ¿no? Justamente este trabajo que él ha arrancado a realizar va, va a conllevar a que en el futuro cercano se desarrollen esos marcadores moleculares. ¿Alguna otra pregunta, por favor? Comentarios. Sam, I have, I have, I have a quick question. Uh, you mentioned earlier during your talk that, uh, for example, this uh, brown spot and uh, potato chips may be related to sugar content. So, how do you differentiate uh, this uh, dark spot uh, with the symptoms of uh, this uh, bacteria? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, the first thing is, um, if possible, we look at the. The, the symptom on the plant leaves, the top of the plant, uh, if we don't have that, we also compare the pattern because the zebra chip disease causes a very unique pattern um, called flecking or it, it's, um, it is a certain way that the, the dark pattern is arranged within the tuber that is not, um, seen in any other high sugar or other type of uh, problem in the tuber. Okay, thanks. Eh, le, le preguntaba a Sam, ¿cómo es de qué diferencia? Bueno, porque al comienzo de su charla mencionó que es, es este, también debido al contenido de azúcares ¿no? que se forman en, en los chips, ¿no? Eh, se, se muestra un, un color oscuro ¿no? en los chips, entonces eso puede conllevar a y hacer una eh, incorrecta identificación de, de los síntomas de la enfermedad, ¿no? Entonces le preguntaba a Sam, ¿cómo es que diferencia eso? Y me dice que eh, también hacen una observación de la planta, ¿no? Si, en, en la parte aérea de la planta, si, si exhibe también los síntomas de la enfermedad. Y de igual manera también comentar, eh, comenta también de que el, el, estos síntomas del, del zebra chip son sí, un patrón común, ¿no? Que ya lo conocen, entonces de esa manera se, <coughs> perdón, se puede identificar, ¿no? O en, otro, en, todas palabras, en otras palabras, se puede diferenciar si, es, si este síntoma es algo abiótico o biótico. Uh, Sam, we have uh, another question. Uh, what's the time frame estimated for the trait discovery to the development of a new chip of a new variety with resistance to zebra chip? Yeah, so I'll, I'll explain a couple of ways. So if, if the discovery of the zebra chip resistance was in a variety, was in a, co a, commercial, a commercial tuber, a, a, a something that is similar to what's already grown, uh, then it would only take Uh, one one or two cycles of breeding, which would be uh, crossing, then uh, obtaining the seed and planting, which would be uh, to get the first the first set of uh, foundation tubers estimated probably four or five years. Uh, but then it takes a couple of more years before it can be commercialized since the uh, potatoes are clonally propagated to have enough to grow large acres. It takes a couple of more years. So something that was in the tetraploid, uh, probably a minimum of six years. Uh, and then if, if it was in the wild species, It may take, it's hard to say because um, that would take a lot of time to incorporate the wild species. However, with 
uh, new techniques, new genetic text techniques that could speed it up. So I would say you're looking at a minimum of 10 years, but more likely 15 years on the wild species. It's a very long, a very long time because even when a commercial variety is developed, um, it doesn't automatically become adopted because uh, it has to be better than than what is already being grown to some extent. Uh, and then it's competing with the, the farmers who want to grow the susceptible ones and still control the insect with insecticide versus the ones who want to adopt a new variety that, that has doesn't have a lot of um, previous history on it. But uh, just, getting, just getting to where something is available, I would say um, a minimum, I, I would say a minimum of five years on the tetraploid and a minimum of 10 years on the diploid. Okay, Sam, thanks. Uh... Bueno, la pregunta era cuánto tiempo mayormente tomaría eh, eh, hasta obtener el desarrollo de una variedad ¿no? que sea resistente a esta enfermedad. Y Sam nos comenta eh, que de, va a depender, ¿no? Puede depender de, si, por ejemplo, si es, una, si es un clon tetraploide, ¿no? Eh, podría de, de, demorar seis años. Si estamos hablando a partir de especies silvestres, por ejemplo, él considera por lo menos eh, 10, 15 años, ¿no? Eh, sin embargo, él nos hace mención de que con las nuevas herramientas biotecnológicas que ya están disponibles, ¿no? Se puede acortar muchísimo ese tiempo, por supuesto. Entonces va a depender mucho de esas cosas, ¿no? Eso nos comenta Sam. Eh, Sam, we have another question in the chat section. Uh, it says, uh, did you try to control the insects before, they, before you spread uh, the bacterium? Uh, what, what, what does that mean exactly on how the, on controlling the insect? Uh, de repente, PV me puede comentar, por favor, sobre su pregunta. In, in the experiment or in the field, uh, in the farm field? I think, uh, I think it refers to your experiment in the farm field. Oh, on the plants beef. Well, no, because I was, I used uh, um, the cages to keep the insect out. So there was no possibility of any insect in the, in there, except the ones I put in there. Hmm. Eh, Sam nos comenta que no había otra, otra, otra opción de que hayan otros insectos. Uh, eh, ¿Por qué? Porque él, él trabajó con jaulas, ¿no? Sus parcelas experimentales estuvieron eh, bajo cobertor. Entonces solamente... Dentro de esas eh, parcelas experimentales bajo cobertura estaban solamente los insectos que él, que él puso, que él introdujo, ¿no? Entonces no habían otros, otros individuos presentes. Fue bajo condiciones controladas totalmente. ¿Alguna otra pregunta, por favor, comentario? Experiencias que deseen compartir de repente... No. Bueno, entonces le vamos a dar las gracias a Sam por su tiempo, por su por comentar respecto a su trabajo de investigación. Esperemos podamos ir en contacto con él más adelante y por supuesto con todos los presentes de igual manera. Gracias por su tiempo, por su atención. Sam, thanks again for your time, for giving this talk. Let's keep in touch, please. As you know, there is so much to do here in Peru in terms of research and so on, to use biotech as well. And so let's keep in touch and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Okay, bye bye. Okay, thank you.